This is chapter 11, Membrane Structure. It's important to realize that every living cell on the planet has, by definition, a membrane. The membrane is the boundary between the living world and the non-living world on the outside. So the answer to this question is yes. Does every cell on the Earth have a membrane? Correct. The main difference between different life forms is that some life forms have a single membrane, as in prokaryotes, and other life forms have multiple membranes, and that's the definition of eukaryotes. So the nuclear membrane would be an internal membrane, as were the membranes of mitochondria, chloroplasts, and the endoplasmic reticulum, as well as other vesicles within eukaryotic cells. I think the most important fact here is the thickness of the membrane. The membrane is quite flimsy. It's only 50 atoms thick, which is 5 nanometers. So if you go back to your understanding of the size of a typical cell, cells are within the range of micrometers. So the membrane represents a tiny fraction of the width of a cell. All natural membranes are made of not just lipids, but proteins too. So naturally, the entire chapter is divided into two parts, one dealing with the lipid component of membranes, and the second half of this chapter deals with the protein components of membranes. If you were to take a membrane and separate the proteins from the lipids, on average, for all living things, the lipid component would weigh 50%, and the protein component would weigh the other 50%. So proteins play a pretty big role in membrane integrity. This is a typical uh, diagram of a eukaryotic cell. And you can see, as I mentioned earlier, in internal membranes are very, very common. And they do surround most of the important structures within the cytoplasm. And they encase the nucleus in a double membrane. So the important thing to realize is some structures like the mitochondria, have a double membrane, as does the nucleus. So chloroplasts have three membranes. If you go back to the definition of life, Mr. Gray plus cellular, cells have to respond to the environment in order to be considered living. Most cells have the capacity to move. So number three on this diagram here indicates that the membrane of a cell has to be fluid enough to be able to reorganize its location, enabling movement. Number two shows you that exchange of materials has to take place in a refined fashion between the outside and the inside. So food particles have to be imported and waste particles have to be exported. And of course, all living cells have to receive information about the surroundings and that information has to be relayed across the membrane in some manner without disrupting the membrane itself. This insert here nicely demonstrates the thickness of a typical membrane in relative sense to the size of a cell. The membrane, if magnified and illustrated as a cartoon, would resemble B. So here we have the lipid bilayer, and it's called a bilayer because we have two layers of lipid molecules arranged in a fashion where the tails are facing each other and the heads are facing the liquid environment on either side. So this will be the outside of the world and here will be the inside cytoplasm of this particular membrane. Not to forget about the proteins, the proteins will be embedded alongside the lipid molecules as indicated here and demonstrated again in future slides. So a three-dimensional view of a lipid bilayer is indicated in panel C, and the protein molecules, if they have the right configuration, may be embedded within the membrane in an orientation that can vary from one protein to another. We'll talk more about proteins in a subsequent slide. So the lipid bilayer is composed of individual molecules. If you survey enough membranes from different cells on this planet, you discover that 
a particular type of phospholipid named phosphatidylcholine is the most abundant of all lipid molecules. Phospholipid molecules have a very similar arrangement of parts. So one end of the molecule normally has charged atoms of some type and we call that the head region. The remaining part of the molecule does not have any charged atoms. It's composed of atoms which have a even distribution of charge and we call those the tails. So lipid molecules are easily divided into a head region and a tail region. The head region of all lipid molecules has some type of charge disparity in that it may have positive charge or negative charge or have a partial charge such as a polarization. So we label those ends of the molecule as hydrophilic, water loving, because they can easily interact with water molecules in their vicinity because water molecules themselves are also polarized. We learned that way back in the chemistry chapter. The other half of the molecule is hydrophobic and the hydrophobic nature is imparted by the atoms that make up the tails and those atoms refuse to partake in any kind of interaction with water molecules preferring to interact with other hydrophobic molecules. The main purpose of this slide is to introduce students to the amphiphatic molecule once again. Amphiphatic means that the same one molecule has a region which likes water and a region which does not like water. Therefore that molecule will orientate itself in a particular direction when placed into an environment containing water. This slide simply expands our understanding of a phospholipid molecule. So here we have the head region, which is actually composed of phosphate groups, as indicated here, with their negative charge. And in the case of this particular one, phosphatidylcholine, the most abundant on the planet, we also have positive charges in the choline component. So combined together, the yellow and the blue region would definitely not associate with hydrophobic molecules. The glycerol part is very important. It's like the connector. It connects the fatty acid tails with the rest of the molecule. In this case, which is very common, you have two nonpolar hydrophobic tails. And if you look up and down these tails, you will not notice any charge distribution. If you look up and down these tails, you will not notice any negative or positive charge distribution, making this tail very hydrophobic. Sometimes you do get double bonds between carbon atoms, which cause the tail to change direction. We call this a kink in the fatty acid tail. Illustrated here are three alternative molecules found in membranes of various cells. So not all cells will have these particular molecules. One very common molecule is called phosphatidylserine. So the only difference between phosphatidylcholine and phosphatidylserine really is the end of this molecule here, where we have a serine component rather than a choline component. In the middle, we have cholesterol. Cholesterol molecules are only found in the membranes of animal cells. Cholesterol is a steroid molecule which possesses these carbon rings and only the extreme end of this molecule here which contains the hydroxyl group is hydrophilic. The rest of the molecule is hydrophobic. And finally at the end of the slide we have a glycolipid. A glycolipid simply has a glycerol component instead of being attached to a phosphate as in the case of a phospholipid it is attached to a carbohydrate. And in this particular case, uh, the carbohydrate happens to be lactose. These are normally found in high proportions in nerve cells, such as brain cells. Just revisiting the amphiphatic nature of molecules, especially when mixed with water molecules, it's important for the students to realize that the entropy of the system changes. In this first slide, we can see we have here acetone, which is a polar molecule, 
when acetone molecules combine with water molecules, the water molecules rearrange themselves to form a cage such that the hydrogen bonding is maximized between the water molecules and the acetone molecule, therefore lowering the energy of the system. When hydrophobic molecules, such as 2-methylpropane, are mixed with water, the water molecules will then only form hydrogen bonding between themselves. That requires an alternative arrangement of the molecules, as well as a different type of energy invested in the system. The water molecules will form a cage around the hydrophobic molecules. Thus, the end result is a structure that possesses the lowest energy possible for these amphiphatic molecules. This stabilizes the membrane and makes it very viable. These animations can be viewed by revisiting the original uploads on CAT courses under the Lectures tab. An interesting property about membranes is that they have no edges. Here membrane is disrupted using sound waves in a test tube and very quickly the membrane reforms a liposome with water on the inside and water on the outside. Once again a figure showing actual liposomes formed from pure phospholipids. Once lipid molecules have been incorporated into membranes, rarely do we see them move from one side of the leaflet to the other side of the leaflet. This process is known as flip-flopping and it does occur but very very rarely. The molecules themselves are free to move within their own leaflet without any issue. And also as mentioned in the previous slide, uh, these molecules are these molecules are thermodynamically spinning around their own axis at a very high rate of speed. An important learning outcome from this chapter is that students understand that the phospholipid bilayer is a very dynamic entity. It can be replaced with new phospholipid molecules quite quickly by living cells. There are three very important variables which dictate the fluidity of this membrane and its ability to exchange nutrients and waste products between the outside and the inside of the cell. The first component is the length of the hydrocarbon tail. The average length varies from 14 to 24 carbon atoms, but that length can be altered depending on the environment in which the cell finds itself. The second parameter is the number of double bonds which are formed between carbon-carbon atoms along the length of the hydrocarbon tail. This is known as the degree of saturation. The more saturated the hydrocarbon tail, the more rigid the membrane. Cholesterol molecules in animal cells increase the rigidity of the membrane, therefore stabilizing it in warm environments. Here we see an animal membrane exhibiting the green cholesterol molecules interdispersed between the red colored phospholipid molecules. Cholesterol, as mentioned before, is a very rigid molecule which interacts with the hydrocarbon tails of the surrounding phospholipids in a way that stabilizes the structure by forming non-covalent bonds. As indicated here, the cholesterol molecule has an orientation which abides by the properties of the surrounding molecules. Next, we address the very important concepts of how membranes are made and how their composition may be adjusted. Understanding this is key to understanding this chapter. When one looks at the membrane form within the cell, we see the phospholipid heads pointing towards us. If one now looks at the cell from the outside, you will also see phospholipid heads pointing towards you. But the two surfaces, whether viewed from inside or from outside the cell, present different phospholipids. So the composition of the membrane is not equal in both leaflets. One leaflet may have more phosphatidylserine, the other leaflet may have more phosphatidylcholine. If that's the case, and it is the case, uh, this membrane can be called asymmetrical 
in this distribution of lipids. This figure here is pretty easy to understand because what it says is that all membrane in eukaryotic cells is made at the endoplasmic reticulum deep inside the cell. Phospholipids can only be added from the cytoplasmic side since the enzymes that make phospholipids are located in the cytoplasm itself and not within the lumen of the ER. So as phospholipids are added, the membrane on one side becomes distorted compared to the other side. And certain enzymes which are resident inside the membrane are able to transfer randomly phospholipids from one side to the other, resulting in the balancing of the number of phospholipids in both leaflets. As it says here, the process is random. So these scramblease enzymes, they do not care which particular type of phospholipid they flip, they do flip to balance the numbers. On the next slide, which I have modified from what's present in the textbook, is that the vesicles that bud off the endoplasmic reticulum would bud off and join the existing membrane of the Golgi apparatus. Here we have a different class of enzyme. These enzymes are not random, they are very particular. So they are going to flip specific phospholipids from one side to the other. And here you can see the green and yellow phospholipids are mainly flipped to the other leaflet, resulting in that leaflet increasing in its number, forming this very constrained bending of the membrane and this automatically leads to the Golgi budding into vesicles and these vesicles then travel to the cell membrane or to other membranes and fuse with existing membrane resulting in the formation of more membrane. So we have two classes of enzymes, the flipases which are specific and as back here we have the scramble lases, which are random. So students need to understand that. In the case of plasma membrane, the result is that the internal leaflet contains its own population of phospholipids, and the external leaflet contains its own separate population of phospholipids. The outside, as you can see here, has been modified further by the Golgi by adding carbohydrates. So the blue molecules represent carbohydrates. I can tell that this is a animal membrane because of the presence of the green cholesterol molecules. And these cholesterol molecules are evenly distributed on both leaflets of the plasma membrane. So if one face of the plasma membrane has its own composition of phospholipids, it can be indicated in green. The other face of the phospholipid bilayer can be indicated in red. So as we said before, the two sides, the two leaflets of the plasma membrane contain different phospholipids. And here you can see the carbohydrates are added by enzymes on the inside of the Golgi apparatus. And when they bud because of the flipase action, they then form vesicles and these vesicles travel along the cytoskeleton within the cytoplasm and make their way to the plasma membrane where they fuse with the plasma membrane, adding membrane and depositing their particular combination of phospholipids. And here you can see the sugar molecules are automatically placed on the outside of the cell and there are no carbohydrates facing the inside of the cell. This is an important difference that one needs to remember. In the case of bacteria, the process is very similar in that they only have one membrane and the enzymes for transferring phospholipids from one phase to the other are located in the cytoplasm, just underneath the surface of the cell. In the second video, part two, chapter 11, we will talk about membrane proteins. Thank you.